We are back with another episode of the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. On this episode, we are joined by Dr. Daniela Whitman. Dr. Whitman is a clinical associate professor at the University of Michigan's Department of Urology. She is an ASEC certified sex therapist and sex therapy supervisor. She is the associate editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Dr. Whitman has published research, review, and opinion articles and chapters on sexual issues in cancer and urologic diseases. Her research focus is on couples' sexual recovery after prostate cancer treatment. Dr. Whitman, we're really excited to have you here, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, a lot of discussions around erectile dysfunction really center on the patient, on the man who's experiencing ED, and less focus is placed on the impact that erectile dysfunction has on the relationship. So today we want to explore a little bit further the impact of an experience and occurrence of erectile dysfunction or a diagnosis of erectile dysfunction on a couple. So before we get started, Dr. Whitman, could you share with our listeners a little bit more about your area of expertise in sexual medicine? Okay. So um, I have had a practice that has been focused on men with prostate cancer and their partners. But I also have seen um, people with sexual problems from the general population and also people with other chronic conditions. So it's been a pretty varied practice. Um, My job as a sex therapist is to help with education because many people really don't know much about their own bodies and how they function sexually. They also don't know if they have a chronic condition, how it has affected them. And then, of course, there's the psychological component and the relationship component. And most of the time, if people have a relationship, you do include the partner because the partner is 100% affected. So my scope of practice uh, goes from individual uh, people, men and women who have sexual problems to couples And um, I've actually conducted groups with uh, couples where sexual dysfunction was the topic. Wow. So not not just individual sessions with a couple, meaning a therapist. And it sounds like in this case, a man experiencing sexual function issues or uh, post or peri prostate cancer treatment issues, but also doing that in a group setting, having multiple couples in that room. Well, so there's a lot of experience that you have in that space of sitting with and working with and really getting into this experience um, and its broader implications. So before we get to the couples, Dr. Webin, I'm wondering in your experience, what are some of the reasons that that occurrence or a Um, more chronic diagnosis of erectile dysfunction is so devastating for a man? So let's start with a man's body image. Men are, you know, born with penises that after puberty have the capacity to have erectile function. Um, Men are surrounded by a culture that jokes about it, that talks about it, that um, is very erection focused and sexual functioning focused. And so a young man begins to see his body. If if he sees his body in full, it should have an erection. So whenever erectile dysfunction happens, it's usually devastating. And it's not just about sex. It's also about body image, about how a man sees himself and how a man sees himself in the culture that we have. And I would say this is probably across um, the world. Uh, In many cultures, that's an important part of being a man, being masculine and being valued. Now, people can have problems with erections for a number of different reasons. There's, there are some people that may, may have had them really almost from the beginning and uh, maybe never had a desire for sex and may have never really stimulated very much, may not have pursued it very much. And then when they have a partner, somehow this is a part of them that does not get engaged very well. It's a little bit mysterious. We think that if, you know, if a man has low testosterone, that can explain it very easily and quickly. And there are also some congenital conditions like Klein- Kleinfelter syndrome. Women have chronically low testosterone and so they'll have problems. 
But people who uh, have a lifelong low desire and poor erectile function, if they are physically healthy, it's very difficult to understand. Just like we sometimes think about, you know, why are some people asexual? Uh, young men can develop erectile dysfunction because of anxiety. It's anxiety about functioning. It's about um, making sure that they sort of fulfill the role that they think they're supposed to have. And we have seen in our clinic um, young men who are college students who may have come to college thinking, oh, this is my time to have a lot of sex. And they go to a party, they get a little bit drunk, they meet somebody they don't know, they try to have sex, they fail. Uh, and you know, combination of anxiety and alcohol, alcohol, and then that becomes a vicious cycle of anxiety and um, erection problems. Yeah. So, so I want to get back to that experience though of devastation. There's a lot of different causes of erectile dysfunction, both you know, on the physical yeah. side, also on the the psychological side. There is that anxiety piece. But when a man you know, first has that that experience of erectile dysfunction. I think kind of going back to a little bit the pieces you're saying before, the culture, the expectations, kind of leads to this experience of devastation. Yes. Um, that 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 this shouldn't be happening. I yes, guess. I mean it's a feeling. You know, men report this as a feeling of very fundamental failure, not just a failure of function, not just a failure of sexual function, but a failure of manhood. And so um, when a man feels like he's not being masculine enough, um, that brings on uh, tremendous anxiety, sometimes depression. And those are the two conditions that will also negatively influence erectile function. So it does become a vicious cycle because men then engage in observing themselves. Every time they make love, they dread it. Um, They observe to see how they're doing. And once they start observing, they're not focusing. And when they don't focus, the erections suffer. Yeah. It, 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 I would imagine becomes very unpleasurable. It's not yeah. something they're looking forward to. And yeah. then you also can get into that cycle of um, a diminished libido, diminished desire, because exactly. it becomes mm-hmm. an observation much more than an enjoyable activity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, Dr. Woman, what is the impact of erectile dysfunction or getting caught in this cycle on a partner and on the relationship? Uh, So I would say that to the degree that the man is in a decently kind, positive, mutually affectionate, appreciative relationship, generally speaking, at least initially, the partners are more likely to be reassuring and supportive and um, remind the man that he can be a lover in all different kinds of ways that can be very pleasurable for the partner and that the positive sexual experience doesn't completely rely on penetration. Uh, That can work to some degree for the man, um, especially if he allows himself to take in that support. Um, But partners become frustrated over time if this becomes more of a chronic problem. And so, you know, you can just imagine that the partner doesn't have any sexual dysfunction, him or herself, uh, but because uh, the male partner has erectile dysfunction, the sex life is altered. Why do some partners seem to internalize when a man is experiencing erectile dysfunction? They seem to believe that it is an affront or they blame themselves for that. What, what, what do you think that phenomenon is? Well, I think this this perhaps comes from, again, it's a cultural thing to some degree, but also... Um, Unconsciously or unwittingly, partners take their cues about their own attractiveness from erections. And, you know, when I became a sex therapist, I don't think I fully appreciated how significant that was for the partners. That if the man had erection, the partner felt attractive, that that was a sign. And so, you know, when I see, for example, men with prostate cancer, they have erectile dysfunction. 100% because of the surgery they've had, you know, so there's nothing psychological there. Um, And the partners have trouble believing that the trouble, uh, the partners unconsciously over the years internalize the idea that erection means they are attractive. 
Uh, I mean, if there's been a problem in the relationship, they could blame themselves for other reasons, but that can be a very devastating thing for the partner to feel like suddenly they're not attractive. Yeah, and the, the prostate cancer example is so great because it really is, it's a biological, physiological yes. issue. Um, it's also not lost on me that um, obviously prostate cancer can occur at any stage of a man's life, but it does have a higher rate of occurrence with age. Um, and in many instances, men's partners, well, in all instances, men's partners are aging with them. Um, but oftentimes it does coincide with a, a time where I think many of those partners are feeling a little bit more insecure themselves uh, with just you know changing bodies, body image and whatnot, also with their own aging process. So I've worked with couples where that has become a little bit of an issue that as some of the challenges with just the aging process have coincided with um, you know, more pronounced erection challenges. And the partner has kind of taken it on their shoulders that if they were you know, a little bit younger, a little bit more fit, um, if they would you know, lose a little bit of weight, that would somehow change the outcomes for their partners, even when their partner has a, a strong biological or even purely biological reason um, that they're yes. not getting erections. So let me just add to that a little bit because. What we should remember is because this is an older population, probably mostly, I mean, the average age is 65, but we see men in their 40s as well. Most of the part and female partners are postmenopausal. And in losing estrogen, they lose their own, some of their own sexual functionality. And the loss of estrogen leads to weight gain for many partners. So they already struggle with what menopause has brought to them. And if they don't understand, like recently, I saw a very sophisticated, educated man in his uh, early 70s who uh, was telling me that, you know, about 20 years before his wife began to gain weight and she lost interest in sex. And this was very problematic for him because they'd always been so very mutual and he had many feelings of hurt and abandonment about it. I discovered he knew nothing about menopause and didn't understand that she would have lost the desire, might have gained weight because of this, and really was sexually a changed woman because of menopause. So people really don't understand what happens to their bodies and, um, what's the word, project their own insecurities on the changes. Yeah, and that, that's a great example of it going in the other direction where the, the male partner felt insecurity yes. about changes going on in his in his female partner. Yes. Um, and he, you know, believed that it was, you know, something that either he was doing wrong or some kind of flaw or failure in the relationship, but yes. really just had a lot more to do with biologics. So Dr. Women, can you talk for a couple moments about this concept called sexual scripts? Um, the idea that we develop routines over time and how a occurrence of erectile dysfunction might begin to reshape those sexual scripts or how those sexual scripts and erectile dysfunction may lead to uh, diminished sexual activity between people. Yes. So, you know, when people first get together, if they're not overly inhibited, they tend to have very lively, maybe even experimental, very varied uh, sexual activity that is exciting, that is fun to return to. But as people get settled into their relationships, they tend to develop routines, as you mentioned. You know, they know what works for them. Uh, they don't always have that much time. Um, it's satisfying the way they do it. And so it becomes their template for sexual activity. Now, if it includes penetration, they usually have ways in which they proceed from X to Y to, you know, that eventually ends up in penetration, mm -hmm. orgasm, and so on. Um, when men develop erectile dysfunction, that um, template is affected because they can no longer do what they used to do, uh, either because they never can get to an erection or because they now have to use assistance for the erection, such as medications or devices. And so that whole, what they were used to, plus spontaneity, you know, let's mention that very importantly, spontaneity goes out of the window because mm -hmm. nothing can be relied on. You know, maybe occasionally the men will have still a spontaneous erection, but if they're unreliable, and especially when they become reliably unreliable, the whole way that people 
um, have sex changes. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, um, we like our routines. Uh, We don't like to change them. Most people don't like unspontaneous sex. And in every case, they have to grieve a loss of something, right? There was something that was satisfying that was important. And now they're grieving a loss. And that's a huge, important part of sexual dysfunction of any kind. Yeah, that's, that's a whole topic in of itself, grieving that that loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, I sometimes, I, I, I you know, think about it. I think what I see clinically is um, sex is really vulnerable. And those scripts, those routines actually help to uh, take down some of that feeling of vulnerability. Um, we come to rely on them. It's mm-hmm. just the way we do things. So we don't even have to communicate about it. We don't have to express things. Everybody kind of knows their part. Mm-hmm. And when we lose those scripts, when something changes, it really kind of conjures up a lot more of this vulnerability. We have to go ahead and communicate uh, in ways that we haven't in the past. And I think a lot of people get uncomfortable with that. Have you have you seen that in your experience? Yeah. So we have actually done some research on this. We interviewed couples before and after surgery for prostate cancer to find out what their expectations were of the dysfunction, what their expectations were of how they were going to react to it. And, um, you know, there are many aspects. And then we interviewed them afterwards to sort of compare what happened before and after, how it actually turned out. So there are many interesting findings in, in that study, but one of the findings was that people basically had, for the most part, nonverbal sex for maybe 30 years. It worked perfectly fine for them. And now because everything changed, they had to be able to communicate. And for some couples, that was a skill they didn't have and they were uncomfortable developing. But, you know, many people can, but for some, it's really a struggle. Yeah. So I want to come back around to the communication in just a couple moments. But as a little bit of a segue, why do you think it is that some men avoid discussing the erection issue. And I know it sounds like a little bit of an odd question because it should seem pretty obvious, but there is a lot of avoidant behavior that I think goes on when men are first experiencing erection challenges. I'm not in the mood. I'm too tired. There's a lot of things that can be done to actually avoid both the experience of erectile dysfunction and having to talk about it. Why do you think it is that there is this phenomenon of trying to avoid So one of the things that, again, we learned from our research and that we uh, have learned from men and that we now teach to men and couples is that essentially any time a person loses any aspect of sexual function, they do have to grieve the loss. People have a really hard time tolerating the emotions that go with it and talking about it brings up the emotions of grief. And couples of men who cannot tolerate the feelings will not want to talk about it. And we, you know, we see that even as people begin to make love in this new setting where everything's different, grief invades their sexual activity because the preoccupation with how it used to be and how it's different now and whether it's ever going to work and whether the partner's going to like it, um, all of those are grief uh, thoughts that diminish from the focus on sexual pleasure and really affect sexual activity. So a little bit of a long answer to your question. I think it's it's lack of, or or the fear, not lack of, but the fear of the emotions associated with grief. Um, You know, as, as you're talking, Dr. Webb, I'm I'm, I'm kind of wondering if it, if it's almost like when we talk about the stages of grief, if there's elements of denial or elements of almost like bargaining, if I can just figure out how to get back to the way things were. And it sounds like they're not quite reaching stages of acceptance and being able to like embrace this newer reality and having to face those feelings of loss is just so overwhelming that avoidance is like the best strategy that they can come up with. Right. I mean, you can't get to acceptance unless until you've processed the grief, the right? you can't get to acceptance. We do have situations, for example, sometimes, so sometimes it's the conversation at other times is, you know, we, we offer men sexual rehabilitation and some of them don't want to do it. They say, well, I'm just going to wait to see what happens. 
you know, it's another version of what you're talking about, of not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to really face what it means that you have to do sexual rehabilitation and that you're going to have feelings about having to use tools and medications to do it. What does it say about you? And so oftentimes I would say these are the men that are more likely to be vulnerable about their masculinity, that they feel really diminished as men. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, again, in our study, we found that men did not expect that at all. They thought, oh, there are so many men, uh, so many ways in which uh, I am defined as a man. It's not just erectile function. But then when it happened, they really felt very diminished. Yeah. And there's there's obviously very deep uh, psychological components to erections and to the fact that, like you're pointing out, men are born with a penis. It's there you know, from day one. It's overt. It's a defining characteristic yeah. in many, for many aspects that it's hard, even when you think there's a lot of other things that define you. When, when there's a sense of loss in what you've come to know, it is very, very challenging. It's hard. Well, to- you, you know, you're right. It's very visible. So they can't hide it from the partner. They can't hide it from themselves and they can't pretend it. Mm-hmm. So. so, Dr. Woman, what do you think a man should do if his partner is blaming him or accusing him of withholding or not doing enough to get an erection? How, how would, would you recommend or suggest uh, might be some ways that a man can handle a situation like that? It's the, when the partner's criticizing. The partner's criticizing. The partner's saying, um, you're withholding from me. You're not interested in me. You're not doing enough to address this. Really kind of putting that extra pressure on top of a man who's already struggling with erections, what would be your your thoughts about how a man should handle this or how that couple should go ahead and handle this? Well, honestly, I think that in that case, they should probably get counseling because it's not, you know, many of these things are not necessarily rational responses. When a person who's having the difficulty is feeling criticized, it's very difficult for them to handle that partner because they internalize usually the criticism and feel guilty and bad about themselves. You know, the person who is criticizing, uh, maybe projecting their own uh, feeling of lack of attractiveness or um, feeling of deprivation of one kind. You know, this can also hark to some older issues in the sexual or just general relationship. So probably counseling is the best because it may rest on the lack of understanding that one or both of them have about what happened. Mm-hmm. So there's both an educational component, um, but it sounds like there also could could very likely be some deeper components, especially yeah. when the expressions seem to deviate from the reality and the rational, mm-hmm. and it seems to be very much emotionally driven. You're saying that that would probably be best handled in a counseling or a couple's counseling setting. Well, somebody has to unravel, you know, what's about, what is, how much is about educating people and how much it is about pre-existing resentments and unhappiness that is either sexual or just generally, you know, relationship. Yeah. That's a really important distinction. I think it probably is best on a case by case basis yeah. with the help of a, of a professional. Now, what are some of the things couples should know about the role of communication when it comes to um, working with or working to improve a sexual dysfunction? When people have a sexual dysfunction, the nonverbal tools uh, are diminished, right? The, the way that we know that somebody's attracted, that somebody's eager to be sexually involved with, with us, uh, those kinds of things may disappear. So if you have a man who has a um, lack of erections, he's not signaling to his partner, I'm interested. Mm-hmm. Um, when he is distracted and maybe avoid, and he's not signaling to the partner, I'm interested, but I'm worried about how it's going to go. So communication becomes important because it can fill in the parts that cannot be purely physically communicated. Plus, it can communicate the emotional aspect because sometimes people get engaged in sexual activity and it's not working and they get very sad or frustrated or upset then communication becomes important because it's important potentially to interrupt at that moment, not continue in a frustrated state and return to the activity at some other time. So communication really guides how the sexual um, encounter is going to go and what couples then 
do is they sort of replace the nonverbal communication and relatively smooth sailing with emotional intimacy, which is important if people are going to be able to recover their intimacy in, in some fashion. Okay, that's very, very helpful. Um, so Dr. Whitman, to, to wrap up, I'm wondering that while men or you know, couples are working toward a solution or adjusting to this new reality, what are some of the things that they can do to maybe help ease that process? So obviously communicating and shifting from the nonverbal to the verbal is, is certainly one thing that could be done to help. What are some other things that might be able to help in this adjustment process? So one thing that's terribly important is to come to the realization that there will be failures and that failures are not the end of anything that failures are just a way of learning about what's going to work. And uh, that that is something that should be either accepted with kind of a certain amount of calm, or even if it is sad, then cry together, or maybe even with a sense of humor. I think sense of humor can be really, really important for that kind of a situation. So accepting failure, then also, being willing to experiment, try new ways of stimulation, try new ways of um, getting pleasure by other means, um, not over-focusing on the part that is difficult. And then finally, if the man has uh, erectile dysfunction that persists, being willing to get medication, get devices, get some assistance so that if people want to have penetrative sex, they can make uh, more sure that that is going to be successful. Okay, that's very very helpful, Dr. Whitman. I really really appreciate you joining us on the podcast for this episode. Really lending your expertise, both in clinical experience and in research. It's always great to um, have you know, that perspective and to know that a lot of the things that we're talking about are you know research backed, research based. Uh, really being able to get that information out to our listeners is really powerful. So again, I thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hosting you in a future episode. Thank you for inviting me and it's been a pleasure.